can maybe have some questions after my presentation here. Um, this is the Metrics Driven UX talk, and uh, my name is Andrew Korf. Um, I'm the uh, UX lead with NativeX. We're a, uh, or a Minnesota based uh, mobile advertising company, and our founder is here somewhere, actually. Uh, Rob right here, uh, and arguably I would say we're one of the coolest companies in Minnesota in technology. We do, uh, uh, let's see here, come on remote, there we go. So what do we do? We do innovation at the intersection of mobile games, monetization, distribution, and advertising. Uh, so we're just games, all games, all the time, all day long. Uh, <laughs> And, and helping game developers uh, make money. What we do technically is we help uh, well-established games with lots of users connect to new games that uh, don't have a lot of users. So we're, we're basically a network that connects um, each side of that equation. We help uh, game developers make money when they, once they've established a really popular game. And then we help uh, new games uh, get new users, essentially. It's in its simplest form. And we do a lot of other things beyond that. but. Um, and, and so what is UX? Um, I think a lot of people here have heard the word UX. It's, it's a, a term that gets misused a lot, I think. It's a blanket term that gets used for everything. And uh, I guess when I think about it, I think about uh, this quote from Jacob Nielsen, which is, user experience encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and products. So it's UX, you know, in its meta form, can be everything that a company does. Uh, and I think for our company, I think about all the touch points that either our end users have within the mobile games or our partners have who are game developers. And, uh, and what we try to do as the UX lead of NativeX is we're working on improving all those touch points no matter what they are, whether they're end users in games or they're actual partners or developers. Uh, what are metrics? Again, everybody here, I'm sure, you know, thinks about metrics all the time, but, but just to sort of level set on that, you know, metrics are a, uh, a method of measuring something and the results obtained from that activity. As a metrics and performance driven company, like, we think about metrics all the time, uh, like daily. And as a UX designer, I think metrics and data are the most important input that I have um, in helping our team decide what to do. So we just look at data all day long and we make decisions based on that performance data, which is what we're all about. We're advertising, we help game developers make money. They care about the performance of their ads or ad units, and uh, our job is to help them perform better and make more money at the end of the day, or, or get users. Why do metrics mat matter? I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with Edward Deming. He's a management uh, guru, but I love this quote of his, that you can't manage what you don't measure. You know, so uh, there's so much design that happens out there in the world where no clear metrics for success are actually set. And we just throw spaghetti at the wall, we give it a whirl, and we see what happens, you know. And I think what, what I try to do with our team and, and we as a company is really set really clear, actionable metrics that can inform our design decision. We'll know whether or not it's actually succeeded. And uh, particularly with performance advertising, uh, you know, the metrics are what our partners really care about, whether it's getting users or, or, uh, or revenue. Without metrics, how do you decide what to do? I love this quote from a guy named Josh Picardo. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's one of my favorite UXers. Um, and all of his books are required reads almost for anybody that's in technology. But his quote is, with prayer becomes the technique of choice with no clear metrics. And boy, like, I don't know about you guys, but there's a lot of prayer that happens out there. Like, let's make a design and try it and test it out in the world, you know? And, <laughs> and you're like, it kind of failed, but we don't really know why. Um, and I think that's something that I would say, I don't know, I'm gonna shoot from the hip. I would say 70 to 80% of design that I see that ha happens out in the world is not metrics driven, you know? And 30% actually has really clear success metrics around what are you doing and how do you know if it succeeds? So we try to, at the company, we really try to be metrics driven and think about what we're doing. Uh, for us, metrics are our key driver for strategic UX. So we get business strategy from senior management. We get clear metrics that are associated with that business strategy. And then we define our UX strategy just to uh, accomplish those, the goals or strategy uh, as defined by senior management. And then we use metrics as our method to show whether or not we've succeeded. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. But the metrics are how we're measured, are how our design decisions are measured as to whether or not, whether they're effective or not. Uh, how do we use metrics to stay lean and move fast? Um, we're evolving, this is a continually evolving process, but 
the company in the past, I think, has been a bit more waterfall, where we move a little bit slower, we see if our design decisions have made sense, move, develop, and slowly work our way potentially to an uh, unsuccessful outcome. And what we're evolving to is being much more agile and lean and get really quick feedback from, uh, from our system and, and understand whether our design decisions are working. It could be as quick as hours or days um, as opposed to weeks or months. <coughs> Uh, here's an example or a slide kind of talking about that idea, you know, that we make design decisions and we, it used to take us maybe a couple of weeks to get the feedback we need to d understand whether our designs are, are um, working or not. And we're really trying to reduce that time down to hours um, and get really quick feedback. <coughs> what kind of met metrics do our partners track? Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with sort of the app economy and how those things work, but there are metrics like DAUs, MAUs, ARP DAO, there's an endless list of acronyms that people are tracking and our partners like to see on their reporting dashboards. Um, and these are things like daily active users, monthly active users, annual revenue per daily active user. I mean, this is the stuff that really matters to game developers. And actually the design solutions that we put out are the, the, the touch points that drive those numbers. So you can see that metrics really matter to our partners, which are game developers. Um, and things like retention, churn, lifetime value, like this is, <laughs> the app business is an extremely met metrics driven business. And it can be really fun, especially as a UX designer, to, to look at those metrics and, uh, and, and work to help our partners achieve optimal solutions. <clears throat> what kind of metrics do we track as a company? Um, again, being a, a performance driven company, we, we look at revenue, hourly, daily, weekly, annual. What kind of volume are we doing on our network? What's our customer satisfaction? What's our net promoter score? This is a, these are ways we understand if what we're doing in our business makes sense. <coughs> um, how do small metrics affect big metrics? This is one of my favorite slides in this deck, but lots of the work I do or our team may be doing will be way down at the very first dot. We're talking about an individual ad or ad unit or a widget that exists in an, uh, a partner's game. And we understand literally that little widget, and there may be millions of them out there in the world, but the performance of that widget can roll all the way up to, at the top level, our company valuation. So when we, we think about these little tiny instances, just one single instance in a single game, when we look at those across our network, we, uh, you know, each individual instance can really have a big impact as it rolls up the stack to add unit performance, then to how our platform performs, some of the things that play into platform performance are predictive analytics, which is a really important part of what we do. Um, targeting, so we understand how we target what we're doing to the right users. Uh, ECPMs, which are basically the benchmark or the, the, the standard metric that our industry uses to understand uh, how high performance uh, our network is doing. And then what are the quality of the conversions? How high quality are the users that are people, that, how high quality are the, uh, the users that are coming off the network? for our partners. Um, and then out of pa pla uh, platform performance comes marketplace perception. How is our network perceived in the marketplace? Uh, which can then drive financial performance and overall company valuation. <coughs> uh, so a quick rundown kind of a methodology that we use for metrics driven UX at NativeX. Uh, first we identify our business objectives. And we try to align as discussed previously, our UX strategy with the business strategy. So everything we're doing is really tightly mapped to our overall business strategy. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not, but we try to map it really tightly. Um, and then we map out our UX life cycle of the products or features or widgets that we're developing or ad units um, to achieve that overall uh, business objective or, or UX strategy. Um, you know, what do we want our users to do to achieve the business goal? <coughs> And then we identify the metrics that support the business goal, which are derived directly from the UX life cycle. So we'll take a look at whether it's an ad unit or perhaps a partner interface and say, these are the things we want to have happen. There are certain metrics that attach to them and we're going to try to increase the performance of those over time, understand if our design decision is working, and then iterate. If it's not working, we should know fairly quickly based on the metrics we're getting uh, whether or not our design solution is correct or not. And then do continuous improvement. We do hypothesis, we think about our design solution, we test it, we measure whether or not it's working, and then improve and repeat. <coughs> Here's a quick kind of overview of our approach to data-driven design. You know, first, again, this is similar to the last slide. We, we try to understand what the problem is we're trying to solve. 
we establish the current metrics, the benchmarks for what, what's going on currently, and then we develop a hypothesis for how we'll improve. We'll say, we want to get a 20% lift, or we want to get a 30% lift on a key metric, and develop a hypothesis. Maybe it's a sketch, maybe it's a wireframe, maybe it's a rendered out, fully interactive ad unit or something. Um, and we'll go out and test that and say, hey, does it get the 20% lift, yes or no? And if not, we'll go back to the drawing bar board and iterate. And then we design, implement, measure, and iterate. Um, and once we come up with a design solution that's really effective, we'll share those learnings um, for continual improvement across our network. So once we nail a, a solution, like let's just say it's a, a widget or an ad unit that performs really well, we'll disseminate that information across our uh, organization so that everybody can use it and uh, iterate on it. Here's a kind of an, an example framework for metrics-driven design. And this is just one of many frameworks that we use, but here's sort of the way that we look at controls for, let's just say, an individual in-game ad, where we have a number of tests, one through five. Um, we have a number of variables for each test, and then we'll see what kind of performance it gets in terms of uh, the eCPM or the actual performance for that combination of data points. And fairly quickly, we can understand that's the right solution, and it's performing 600% higher than the control, which happens frequently. It's really cool. So who is on the UX team driving this product development? We have the UX and design team. We have the product team. Uh, our partners, of course, are a really important part of it because we're designing things for their games, which is really fun. Um, the engineering team, the team that actually builds this stuff and brings it to life. And then all important, uh, our data science team. Those are the guys that give us the data, measure the data, analyze the data, and give us the information we need to be able to make good design decisions. So a few examples from our network that are just kind of fun. Um, I don't know if anybody plays Subway Surfers. It's an enormous, endless runner game. Uh, and one of our favorite partners out of Europe. Um, just small improvements to their interaction design, design of the ad widget or unit that we have in their game yielded them 250% higher conversions in just a day. So they're making almost three times as much money from us as they were the day before. This is another great game, a company out of Canada that, uh, that we work with a lot and I spend a lot of time talking to. Um, little adjustments to their, uh, to their kind of funky, really cool ad unit that was psychology based yield them 85% higher conversions. Next thing you know, they're, they're, they're making almost double the money they were previously. <clears throat> this is a really funky little company out of New York. They came up with a Flappy Bird knockoff and shot into like the top 50 Apple charts and came to us and like, hey, we want to run some ads with you. And, and, uh, in a day, we knocked out this real quick kind of funky little ad unit for them that yielded them 700% higher uh, conversions and, and revenue, which was a lot of fun. It's just kind of funky and goofy, but super fun when we can help these little tiny companies really grow their business fast. Or, you know, more standard UX, you know, it's it, like forms. We'll work on lead gen forms as part of our, uh, our business partner um, interface. We're just simplify, simplifying the UX, simplifying the interface a little bit, yielded 35% uh, uh, better completion rates and much better quality leads. So the future, this is one of the things that really excites me about working with NativeX and working in this industry is, I, I don't know for sure, but I believe iOS, they'll, they'll, they'll be launching uh, um, iOS on, the, uh, on Apple TV, which means we'll have all these apps coming to our big 60-inch screens, which is going to be pretty interesting as apps come in and invade the TV space and take over as a primary source of that lean-back um, entertainment in the living room. And I think that's going to be really exciting for us as brands come in and say, hey, we want to be part of all those eyeballs that um, are now shifting from TV channels and cable channels and, and uh, uh, series or whatever to playing games on that 60-inch screen. Uh, so quick summary. Um, I guess at NativeX, we think about design never being finished, whatever it is. If it's a partner-facing interface, if it's an ad unit um, within a game, if it's even a business process, um, we're always working, we're always iterating, we're always learning. And we look at small adjustments ba based on real data over time can really help hu yield huge results. Um, we try to do uh, incremental optimization to uh, help us move forward slowly 
in steps, and then eventually we'll be we'll we'll get big innovative uh, leaps in what we're doing. In fact, right now I'm working on something where almost the way we do everything on the network, we're thinking about doing sort of a uh, uh, a big jump and move forward um, in a big way. Uh, Metrics are typically used to confirm or deny hypotheses, but not drive them. So we come up with our design solution, we think it through, and then we use metrics to measure whether or not that works, but not necessarily take the absolute metric to say, that's what you should do. If the button needs to be blue, based on the, pr the data, we take that, we think about it, we use it as a part of our, uh, our design thinking for the next solution, but not just say, every, all buttons must now be blue based on that data. Um, which is kind of the Google way. I think you guys have seen some of those uh, uh, stories of how Google does data-driven design, and, and sometimes it can yield kind of chunky results. But um, And then this one's really important for me. If the metrics are not ap actionable, like if you don't understand what those metrics are or what that data is, um, it's probably not that useful. I know for me, I'll get data that's either inconsistent or I really don't understand it, and I don't know how to use that data to then uh, recommend a solution to our team. Or, uh, or move forward. So really thinking through whether or not you understand that data clearly and what it's telling you um, is really important. And I thought I would open it up for questions and discussion. Maybe talk about how do you use metrics and data to inform design strategy, um, to inform your design strategy and business success. If anyone wants to share like either A, questions, or B, uh, ways that you use data to um, succeed. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think what we see on those, when we see, let's just say, an ad widget or something like that, that um, that gets higher conversions, but the the light or the retention rate of the game um, holds steady, that then you're seeing actually the the game developer um, making more money from their ad unit or, or widget, and. Uh, if the retention rates stay solid, it means that we're not negatively impacting the actual uh, user experience of the app, if that makes sense. So those are ways we kind of look at both sides, like are we achieving our business strategy but also achieving the uh, user experience goals. Does that make sense? I think that, that's an interesting one. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with that whole the discussion going on around dark UX. And, and I think the idea is that dark UX is typically defined as like negative user experience design where you do things to trick users or sort of get them to do things that they're not sure that they want to do. Um, and, I, and I think it's something that we like look at, especially in game design. I mean, in game design, there's dark UX everywhere. Like every game you play, like if you play uh, Candy Crush, you know, and you get hustled on, on into that next level. I mean, that inherently is dark UX design. You know, and that's something that we're working on gamifying the experience where it gets really addictive and you can't wait to click that button. You know, <laughs> that's like the definition of, of sort of dark UX design. Um, I think there are things that you can do that are really negative, like auto-checking the, uh, the um, feedback box or whatever, or adding you automatically to an email list that are bad. And then there are other things you could do that are a little bit more subtle that sort of says, hey, this is kind of what the user wants to do anyway, or this is what the game developer wants to help achieve their business goal, and you kind of blur the line. So I think that's something that like, as you're thinking about UX design, you really need to feather the pedal there versus user experience design, and then uh, what are the business goals? You know, what's the app developer trying to achieve to make money from their app? Um, you know, in the freemium business that we're in, all of this stuff is basically free entertainment. So you're like, hey, here's my free game, you know, but these guys actually need to make money to keep their game studio alive. We work with a lot of really small game studios that are just eking by, like they're barely making a living, and they're making these really cool games like Big Blue Bubble or like My Satan Monsters, but what we try to do is help them take that, that nascent, really small business and small user base and grow it and really turn it into a real game studio, which means you gotta make money some way, either it's through ads or IAPs, and those are 
typically the two ways that all these millions of little studios actually make money. And what we try to do is, is help them do that monetization in the best way for their users, which is really fun and really cool. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I think one of the examples that I've shown is in the dark UX patterns, you tend to have really high initial metrics, but then the down the funnel metrics really fall apart. Yeah. Like for example, you might see ads in mobile where it's like pretty deceptive. It just says like, hey, here's a free app of the day. And it kind of, it just sort of gets, those kind of ads get high picture rates. But the, at the end of the funnel, they end up at about the same place as a, you know, maybe a more integrated advertising campaign. I think that, you know, that just speaks to Know, the, the metrics of sort of, of dark UX. Like mm -hmm. There's ways to persuade people doing things that they value and make it easy for them, but there's also ways to do things that they don't value. Yeah. They, you know, th there are ways to use metrics to figure that out. I, I think that's one of the funnest things of working with game developers is we really try to fit into their game experience to sort of say, hey, look, these guys have emotional or intellectual engagement with the game or perhaps the characters in the game or whatever. And if you can sort of use that use those characters to help set up what drives your app economy, um, it can be symbiotic. You know, what does is, what is an user care? If, if there's a character that recommends another really cool game and they can download it for free, it actually can be a symbiotic uh, experience rather than a negative experience, which is fun when that happens, but. Uh, so usually we'll have a benchmark going into anything. We'll have a target rate for a conversion rate or whatever it is we're doing. You know, it could be um, customer signups and our partner facing interface, or it could be one of these widgets, like how many users do we want to have engaging with it at what rate. And we'll have a target right out of the gate. We'll know what we're going to try to hit. And we'll know within 24 hours whether or not we're hitting our targets and then start iterating based on that. You know, if we completely miss our targets, we're like, go back, go back to square one and rethink what we're doing entirely. If we're right on target, then we can start moving forward incrementally. Um, and then in terms of fall off, like, I think like anything, you know, games can have life cycles that might be a day or two days or seven days or maybe a month. And same thing with any of these um, little pieces of code that we put out there in the world. You know, they'll be effective for a while, but then we'll have to iterate and improve them over time. <coughs> We do both, and it depends on if it's a partner-facing interface. We do a lot of user testing, face-to-face, -face, remote. Um, you know, that would be sort of our client-facing interface. But um, with the actual uh, user in-game in interface, we typically go live. We're like, okay, cool, we kind of know what works here. We'll go ahead and test those things out, and we might segment it. We might only show that traffic to audiences in Australia. And we're like, okay, Australia, does this work? It works great in Australia, okay, cool, let's move it across the globe. Or maybe we'll say a percentage of the audience. Let's just show it to 10% of your um, DAUs. You'll see how it performs with that 10%. And if it performs poorly, we'll go back to square one. If it performs great, we'll open it up to more than 10%, if that makes sense. So there are you know, lots of cool things you can do with networks with testing, especially when you have millions of daily active users. You're like, okay, cool, we just showed it to a million people. We know exactly what's, whether or not it's performing right. And, uh, and then move forward, so. <laughs> yeah. That would probably be a really good question and a whole nother talk for our awesome data science team, but, um, uh, We'll do really interesting multivariate testing. Actually, every one of those little widgets that you saw have um, many different points that they can be configured, whether it's a call to action, the way that it loads, what's the ad combination to the publisher integration. There are so many dimensions to these really simple little interfaces, where they're placed in the game, et cetera, et cetera. There's just a, a ton of dimensions that we look at and we optimize for. So we'll, we'll go ahead and run maybe 
six placements, which means they exist along a timeline in the game, and we'll have different variations of, a, of an integration um, across those placements. And then predictive analytics and data science will tell us, hey, this one's performing really well, but that one's kind of interrupted to the game experience, kill it. And uh, you know, we'll learn, like I said, we'll learn over a weekend what we should be doing, and we continually um, iterate. Yeah, we're, everything's in-house. We have really great technology, a great engineering team, and really great uh, data science team that, that help us understand this stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, if you're interested in third-party tools for A-B testing, one that, if, uh, one that I like for mobile would be a <coughs> company called Lean, Lean Club. Yeah, the web YouTube team created this um, software that's pretty lightweight, and there's certainly a lot of other, probably other thousands and dozens of companies. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. What, what sort of data do you collect by looking at the screen? And again, as a UX team, like we've got, you know, there are a number of different things we do, and those are the widgets or the units that live out there in the world are just one little piece of what we do as in terms of design. Our partner-facing interface is like very, very important. And what we do for in the games that actually exist out there in the world, the end users um, touch is quite different than what we do for our partner-facing interfaces. So <laughs> I could answer the question, but it's but it's um, it, it depends on which um, piece of our code actually users are touching. There's only so much data that we can actually capture, and the, our partners, the game developers, um, uh, they have more data than we do, right? Because it's their game, it's their iOS app, and and we're able to access some data, like, um, uh, you know, we'll understand from a geo, we'll know what geo our, this ad unit may have been shown in, whether it's you know, Australia, Europe. Asia, you know, will have quite different understanding of the users based on their uh, where they're at geographically. If that makes sense, <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and I kind of mix apples and oranges there a little bit. You know, and if it's an individual widget instance that exists out there in the world, um, I think, like I said, there's a decay over time, and we're constantly refreshing and changing um, how those things actually uh, manifest themselves within games. And, um, and so it's, it's a business of endless innovation and, and, um, and change uh, to help keep things fresh, per se. Yep. What's that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we we'll see we'll see that where um, an user base, let's just say over a, a month or three months, will become used to that interface that's happening within the game, and um, and it'll need a change. It'll need some evolution. It'll we'll have some new media. Um, the other thing that's really important is the actual media that's coming in off our network. You know, what types of fill do we have for uh, those ads? And if it's always the same for the users, of course, they'll get tired of it and, and go away. But if it's really cool and compelling, they'll engage with it. So, cool. Do we have one more? Cool. So we're looking for, um, we are definitely looking for UX designers and uh, um, uh, front end engineers. So if anybody knows anybody who's a front end engineer, HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, we're very actively looking for uh, those types of folks. Um, and it's a really fun space. You know, it's games, it's mobile, it's advertising. So it's a super fun place to work. Um, but uh, yeah, and then also UX designers. So if anybody has a reference or referral, please come talk to me. I'll be around here for a few hours today, and then Rob's talking this afternoon. So definitely check that out.
Cool. Thanks a lot, you guys.